Welcome to the Globalism Research Centre seminar. Um, it's a pleasure to have you here. It's a great privilege to have uh, Professor Mojtaba Sadriya here um, speaking to us today, with us today. Um, Mojtaba, or Professor Sadriya, arrived recently from Iran where he spent the last five years establishing a, uh, a think tank, the think tank for knowledge excellence in Tehran. Um, Professor Sadio was born in Iran, but he's had a very um, diverse and we could say a, a truly global um, life as an intellectual and a scholar. Um, Professor Sadio left Iran when he was a teenager. I think he ran away from home. I think that was the story, wasn't it? <laughs> and he, um, he's since had a, an extraordinary um, life as a philosopher, a socio-cultural theorist, a cross-cultural relations expert, and an expert in East Asian studies. Um, Professor Sadria, in, um, as I said, is truly a global scholar. His education has drawn from all different regions of the world. He, um, he was educated in Germany for international law, uh, in France for philosophy, including, I, I think I know, he studied for many years with Michel Foucault as a student. Um, he was educated in Canada for international relations and cultural studies. Um, he's held many positions around the world, including at Aga Khan University, Chuo University, University of Tokyo, and uh, the University of Montreal. He was an intellectual contributor to the UN Dialogue Among Civilizations, a member of the Kyoto International Culture Forum, and we're very proud to say that he's also a Tutu Fellow with Global Reconciliation. He's published over 50 books and articles, and I really encourage you to look some of those up and to read them. Um, his written work is absolutely excellent. Um, I think it's safe to say that Moshtaba is, is one of the world's great intellectuals, and it's an absolute pleasure to have him presenting here for us today. I want to welcome Moshtaba. Note also that um, that Mostova's uh, presentation is going to be filmed today. So just in terms of background noise, but also in terms of um, whatever considerations there might be in relation to that, I wanted to let you know as a courtesy that it's um, it's being filmed. So thank you very much. Good afternoon. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, I think today you were supposed to have Paul Commissar as lecturer, and he kindly. Uh, switched with me because I'm here for a uh, brief period. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, some of you are people who have been reading this great project on globalization and globalism. And uh, so it's, it's really a privilege to be here. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, one of the fascinating aspects of globalization and globalism for me is the power of word. The word global, globalization, before being a reality, which has been for ages, in our present time is the effect of power of a word. And this word came to be influential from a country which was in one of the most fragile situation of its post-war history, the United States. At the end of 1970s, when the arguments was uh, preferably about uh, Japan as number one, 78, and uh, uh, Japan as soft power. So when we are discussing about a transformation of the nature of power, power state in the international arena. Uh, the concept of globalization came from the United States and it wasn't with military might linked to it. And I would even pretend it was not necessarily related to economic power of the time of the United States. Because the argument was that the United States was losing momentum. But this concept of globalization brought a possibility for the United States to 
have tremendous impact in the world arena and brought very important new instrument affecting the world. It was at short time very instrumental, uh, very instrumental for the negotiation going on for GATT becoming WTO. So it was a very important uh, element of discourse, weakening resistance of the countries who are still in the frame of nation states arguing. So we have uh, witnessed in the last uh, 35 years the rise of a concept which uh, the concept you would agree with me at least for a long time it was nebulous. We didn't have much content for it. And this nebulous concept, though nebulous, touched many layers of intellectual uh, or intellects across the planet because of the word global, because of ideological positive connotation of this borderlessness that it was advocating. And uh, this was attractive. The concept of having a borderless world, at the moment of the world that all borders have some kind or other of problems, was very fascinating, was attractive. And I think this attractiveness of borderless world uh, was part of the power of the world. This attractiveness brought the impact of it much bigger uh, and made it a possibility to uh, accept it in a non-imposed hegemony position. So globalization became, uh, for 20, 30 years, a fundamental hegemonic concept which affected our lives in different societies in different ways. Uh, and Maybe, maybe September 11th was a turning point. Because post September 11th, the setting of the world arena is not anymore in favor of borderlessness. On the contrary, we came very, very borderly since September 11th. And all kinds of borderly, all of you know. So some simplified definition of uh, globalization, as McDonaldization, as T-shirt, as at the time, at the time it wasn't yet iPhone, it was uh, some other gadget that was the, the technological proof of uh, globalization. And first, uh, September 11. This borderlessness has evaporated, at least for one of the major elements of the, I would say, uh, three bases, three columns of globalization as defined in the 1980s, which was free movement of capital, of merchandise, and of people. So the people part of it, uh, you are not anymore for free movement of people. And this free movement of people uh, is a fundamental element for free movement of capital. Because capital has a cultural element in it. We don't have a, a tasteless, colorless, smellless capital. The, uh, management theories try and attempt to uh, push and prove that it is, I think, the Japanese capital in the world plays a completely different role than American capital. Both of them are capital. Both of them are looking for very, very important uh, uh, gains. But Japanese capital is much more political than American capital. Japanese state is a very influential regulator, 
directly regulating the movement of the capital by Japanese multinational corporation. So when you, in this borderless, globalized world, when one element was free movement of people, and this has been diluted to the long, very, very important part of it, the movement, the free movement of people has become problematic and is it's problematic when we talk about free movement of people, we have in mind maybe right away what is happening at the border between the United States and Mexico. The way that the United States is having a new militarized border for the first time since its inception at the war of unification of the United States. So the, the, the fact that southern border of southern border of United States is the most important barrier for free movement of people, or in Europe refugees, I guess in Australia refugees issues. No, this is not my first emphasis. I come to it, but this is not my first emphasis. My first emphasis is for those who advocated globalization as free movement of capital, of merchandise technology and people, technology and capital need cultural careers because they are in very specific setting, form and acting. My reading of capital and technology is it is culturally bound. There are tremendous pressure to make it colorless, smellless, but it has not yet succeeded. Korea has multinational corporations. They act in Korean cultural setting. They are not disconnected with this cultural element. So if a globalization as first it was advocated, first it was presented, had very important attractive element because of this idea of globe and connectedness of people across the planet. One political element, let's define it political, September 11th, stop this free movement, movement of people. And then another uh, uh, element connected to it, people who could not anymore as freely as globalization was advocating move around because it has become the culture has become more obvious element to consider. Then globalization now is limited to the capacity of headquarters, corporations, headquarters to establish global strategy for their corporation. That's my first point. My first point is, is not no more the discursive element of 1970s, 80s. It has become any corporations which reaches a certain dimensions would uh, in its headquarters establish where they can expand and how they can expand. So it's basically headquarter corporations strategy building up. We have in a very important, at least epistemological rupture from main discourse on globalization at the beginning of it and uh, a present practice of globalization that first of all the discursive element of it has become much weakened not many people talk about global situation of the world anymore <coughs> if it comes to Ebola uh, outbreak now Unfortunately, somebody in London also got it, and we don't know when and where. In uh, North, others will get it. But it didn't need Ebola. It, it was a certain number of issues of planet related to ecology, related to... Uh, these were still elements of globalization, but these were negative globalization. They were not positive globalization as connectedness presented in 1980s uh, is its attractiveness. 
So first, my first point, please, uh, to, to just close that first element. We have an, a mutation of globalization from an element of discourse which was extremely attractive and it touched chords of different layers of the society, different societies. We have come to a situation that some elements of this uh, discourse as free movement does not no more exist and nobody anymore insists on it. And furthermore, it is becoming more and more an issue of multinational corporations, corporation, the strategy, how they can exist. This being said, my second point, nevertheless, heterogeneization and homogeneizations of cultures happen. Culture change, and these cultural changes simultaneously creates pressure for homogeneization and pressure for reproducing heterogeneity. <coughs> First of all, homogenization of cultures have a very important, powerful instrument, <coughs> which is art, which is communication, which is uh, the scene that has become very, very broadly, uh, I guess, with Grameen telecommunication in Bangladesh, you can say this practice is borderless. Your mobiles, uh, this, my observation uh, on our usage of mobile is uh, so interesting. And I think we need to write and work a lot on what mobiles is doing to us, not because of its bad ways, but what kind of human being will be if our mobiles is taken away from us for one week? Who are you if for one week you don't have your mobile? And not only in Melbourne, cross planet, we have a new situation that me as human being, I depend on my connection with this thing, more than the, with the people who are the, uh, at the other end of these things are connected to us. So, a huge uh, technology pressure, cultural pressure, artistic pressure for homogenization. And this is related to capital, is related when is supposed iPhone 6 to come out next month? Is September what? Which day of September? Right? The iPhone, I have no idea. Come on. September 10, 20? Yeah. Is the, 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 the leak that it will be heavier, bigger, maybe more expensive? And this becomes information of information, IT magazine, journals, issues of evaluation, the cost, the benefit, the uh, shares of Apple Corporation, how much will go up, what will come down. And so smartphones uh, is so funny, is so important, is so primordial. Uh, to human relation, pseudo human relation. There is a human being on the other end of it, but the number of times you are connected to that human being, eye to eye, flesh to flesh, and the number of times you are connected through this smart thing. I don't know what, is there any study here, what is the proportion of it? In some places, they don't meet each other anymore. It's much more. They talk about love uh, many more times in this smart instrument than they do love. Uh, 
this has tremendously affected the world. If you are in Cairo or in Istanbul or in Delhi, the same process is happening. The same mechanism is taking. And this is a cultural phenomenon uh, that we include all social factors that you want, level of education, economic situation. It's a, but it's, it's a practice that towards homogenization, towards weakening social links. In one hand, it weakens social links. On the other hand, it has capacity to strengthen social links. At the same time, the same technological element has this paradoxical effect. So, his 34th day I have in Melbourne. I have been here for one month and two days now. It's my longest stay in Australia. It is good, and during these 32 days I am here, I am directing every morning and every night uh, all the people who worked with me for five years in Tehran. I am writing uh, two hours uh, minimum every day to what to do, how to do, since they closed our think tank. And this touches 5,000 people, around 5,000 people. So, it helps to connect and it helps to disconnect. Both of them are our practices. And uh, for this perspective of a pressure, a technological pressure, a cultural pressure of homogenization and what I call acculturation, what Ashish Nandi calls deculturation. Uh, there is an element, a process of enculturation, using this sphere of uh, cyber in order to strengthen your culture, to bring something in, to add something to yourself. This also covers art, and one of the area that we have more seen it is music. The way that in many places of the world, fusion music is growing. And this fusion music, many of the musicians who are using it, they use the element of music which is heterogeneous to them. They bring it through access to cyber. Many of them don't have economic resources or uh, political situation to go to the place where they can absorb this element uh, physically, so they use the cyber. Uh, would it be possible to have a glass of water? Just uh, if it is possible. Sorry. Uh, and these processes are working on a setting that I call normal situation. This is a situation of quote-unquote normality in the sense that institutions are working, uh, survival strategies are happening, different strategies are being shaped, etc. But the phenomenon of acculturation and enculturation changes uh, the rhythm, the content, the process of it when we are in abnormal situation. When the situation, institutions do not exist, uh, strategies cannot be shaped, individual strategies or uh, group strategies cannot be shaped. So when we are in abnormal situation, and this abnormality is primarily in the larger part of the world, as far as I studied, due to inefficient corruption. I define two sorts of corruption. Corruption can be well, said one of the most universal practices everywhere in the world. 
the degree, the intensity of it might change, but it is the. Uh, what is important is we have maybe two sorts of, two kind of corruption. Thank you so much. Sorry for bothering. We have two sorts of corruption. Corruptions which those who are decision makers take a larger part of social resources, economic resources of the society, but they affect the society in, in certain ways. Society gets some benefit, or benefit of their uh, process of action. Uh, I don't know to what extent. I think China could be called in that process between 19, end of 1970s and beginning of 21st century Chinese situation. Maybe for first time in Chinese history, 300, 400 million of Chinese were not anymore worried about becoming hungry. Chinese economic development brought for 300, 400 million people a distanciation from the fear of hunger. This is the first time it's a social phenomenon, very really amazing social phenomenon. It's all the, I, I am aware of negative aspects, everything one would want to say, but uh, so Chinese politicians have been corrupted, yes, every day that anybody in China wants to uh, rise to power proves that someone else has been corrupted. It's one of the most fascinating elements in China. Argument about corruption is uh, one of the strategies for another branch of power to rise to power. And it's not only China. So, but in other parts of the world, the same corruption ex might exist and doesn't have the same impact for the society. It doesn't affect the society. So most of abnormal societies situation where the institutions cannot work. Why institution can, institutions cannot work? Because they have lost their legitimacy. Because people don't believe in them. They don't trust them. So when the institutions cannot work, cannot a regulatory factor in the society becomes inexistent. Society is not more regulated. Social relations cannot be more regulated. Power relations are there, but social relations are not regulated. In those situations, so we are, I call that situation an abnormal situation. An abnormal situation due to primary, the loss of legitimacy is, is a moral, is an ethical issue. People see the level of corruption of decision makers. They know it before it comes to media. Even if it doesn't come to media, they know how, how wide is the practice of corruption. And this practice of corruption has the effect that institutions cannot work, the impact of institutions as regulatory factors are reduced. And because of this reduction, we come to a position that social relation, thus cultural relation in the society, become dysfunctional in the sense that inner dynamics of cultural change is not only, is not anymore the main factor of cultural change. Before institutions become dysfunctional, become in some societies even irrelevant, cultures change, social group culture change, subgroups culture change, but these changes were primary outcome of their inner dynamics and secondary the intercultural relations with other part of the society. But when institutions cannot work, or do not have any more the effect, for different reasons that I underline the, the factor of corruption, then uh, the inner dynamics of cultural change become disrupted. How do they become disrupted? Two, two disruptions emerge first. Generational regulatory factor gets disrupted. Gender regulatory factor gets disrupted. 
gender relations become completely dysfunctional as the group dynamics that it has, and generations become completely uh, uh, dysfunctional their relationship. In this regard, many of the literature on acculturation and enculturation tend to be too generalized, and in becoming too generalized, they become essentialist. I don't think younger generations necessarily they are a factor of heterogeneity. I don't think so. I think broadly saying yes, but essentially no. Uh, we have in different societies, younger generation, who are very extremely conservative, extremely val traditional value tainted. And they are not, they don't move towards the heterogeneity. They don't move through towards enculturation. The same for women being uh, penalized uh, in this situation. I am not at all certain. Uh, and I will give some cases uh, later on in my talk. So I think. When we are in abnormal situation, generation and gender act as two major factor of acculturation and enculturation. By but I put a bemol in it. I, I lower this level. It depends on many other factors. So, first of all. Let's define what do I understand. I think it's clear for all of you what is acculturation is losing your cultural element. You lose your cultural elements by trying to cope the identity of the other. You are not moving on your own ground of identity. You are moving on the ground of identity of other. So you cope its cultural behavior, its values, etc. Enculturation is incorporating elements of culture of other into your culture, rejuvenating it, strengthening it, uh, helping it to, to, to change, to be more to your time zone connected. One of the spaces where acculturation and enculturation happens and can be rather more easily observed is within immigration communities, immigrant communities. The process of being in two cultural zones simultaneously. If you are in your family in one given cultural zone, elements, structure, and in society, in your surrounding, you are in another cultural zone, elements, structure, then there is a tension, and this tension multiplies if you are in abnormal situation. So two elements, one is to be, to be landed in a heterogeneous surrounding, and second is to be in a situation of abnormality. When I said immigration, I have first in my mind urban migration. We underline too much heterogeneity of culture when people immigrate to other society. I think this is much uh, wider, broader experience in the societies within which urban migration is a recent, rapid, vast phenomenon. So rural people who come to the cities and set down women and the younger generation they are in a situation of centripet position towards value system that the family was carrying. And if the surrounding is in dysfunctional uh, situation, you have the acculturation and enculturation in a much more 
rapid and wide uh, process of being shaped. So this uh, much faster speed of this being shaped now happened in this class. We passed from 10 minutes to 5 minutes in 30 seconds. That was good. <laughs> so uh, I want to tell you that mechanism of acculturation creates a tremendous amount of personal stress, psychological stress. People cannot define anymore who they are. When they, find, they try to define themselves, they go very often back and they take pick up of the back stage situation. Mm. Formulation I come to be for those who are in the process of acculturation in young generation who are for going to universities, etc. Their value system, their hidden value system remains pre-modern. Their knowledge becomes modern. And they are forced to have a postmodern discourse. I repeat, a person who is in a society which is dysfunctional, a young person, imagine he finished, she finished her undergrad studies, now he's first year of grad school. This person, value system, primary reference is pre modern. They came to the city five years ago. Where they used to live, the values were much rigid, stiff. And these values in heart are hers or his. He goes to university and he reads Habermas. So the knowledge that he is taking in institutionally, in relative terms, but content-wise, most of the case is modern. Most of the books that are taught in Turkish universities are translated of Western thought. And when he, she wants to be in intimate relationship, the discourses are very postmodern, very liberated, very short, time span defined, etc. The music that they use in order to tell themselves who they are is very music related to a postmodern setting. So this situation of acculturation and enculturation in positions that crisis is there, institutions cannot work normally. I don't know what is your image of Turkey in the last few years, uh, is Islamic government in Turkey. The, the, there is a standstill situation for decision-making processes. Uh, local government, uh, provincial government, and central government still are in the position of filtering who is with us, who is against us. And it's not a process of uh, functioning of institutions because directors don't have uh, security of remaining director next month. And this creates complete paralysis of the institution. And I can, I can name other institutions as well. So this situation brings young generation and women in such a, such, such a context to go for enculturation much, fa much faster. They are victims of acculturation, but they are active actor of enculturation. And therefore, suddenly, you see a transformation of woman situation, woman position in Turkey, which is fascinating. Is not the result of state action generating that? Is not the result of woman organization? Is individual women who, in the situation of pressure of acculturation, have moved towards an enculturation and they have created empowerment 
that is specific to their own context and they become gradually the main beneficiary of it. So, uh, for me, the concept of globalization impact was due of attractiveness of the concept at discursive level. Post 1911, 11, the, this element of free movement of people was completely stopped, even at discourse, and nobody today anymore talks about that. And it become it became more and more an element of headquarters of multinational corporations, a strategy of expansion. And this expansion has its own problems because of limitation of mobility of people. But because my reading is capital is capital that is not colorless, cultureless. It is very linked to the setting where it is formed, shaped, and, and aspires to grow. The second element is the process of cultural change is universal. It happens everywhere. This process of cultural change today is under the influence of a very important technological innovation which covers a mid-layer of the society across the planet. And this uh, technological transformation is career of value system which itself becomes an element of acculturation and acculturation. My third argument was about when <coughs> we are in normal situation, acculturation and acculturation take place anyhow, but the main dynamics of cultural change is the inner group dynamics, inner situation dynamics. When we are in abnormal situation, is outside factor that becomes much more important. And this outside factor, the main ingredients of it, is culture and in culture, the element of art. state. If population perceives policies of the state as corrupted policies, uh, and these policies affect wider range of the society. So it kind of normal pattern of social insertion becomes constantly attacked by policy of states that is not considering those social insertion as a primary concern. 
So the position of land, the position of water, the price of gas, multiply as many as you want, the price of electricity, the price of housing. These elements, the price of housing, the price of electricity, the price of gas, etc., the possibility of employment, all of these are being jeopardized by political rents. So policies are not primarily concerned with reproducing uh, social relations. Primarily is to withdrawing political rents. And this withdrawal of political rents has implications in the capacity of social reproduction in the sites that the social reproduction was taking place. Now that the social reproduction cannot take place, let's say in countryside, in the villages, in rural areas, so people are forced to come to urban areas in order to compensate the impossibility created by policy of states to uh, maintain their social insertion. When they come to cities, when they come and they migrate, what happens? The first element that happens is a reduction of power of men. Men in rural area had a position that was, John? You, no, no, I, I will tell you why it's different. Was a position that socially was recognized as dominant. Women had power, but social recognition that men was dominant power, this, when they migrate to urban areas, there is no ground for it that man has to be the dominant element of the family. Particularly in rural, in urban areas, very fast, very fast, women of desegregated social groups came wage air earner. By earning, they becoming, they, they are the first, I have done some observation, I cannot say it's research, so observation, in many places you have, you see women take uh, home work. They, come, they become helper. And the income of helpers very often is 50% to 50% over the working income of their husband. And that completely changes the setting. Now she knows she is in another social insertion. And this new social insertion is then in no way regulated because laws that are going on about the relation of gender, family, <coughs> are laws that are linked to the situation they were in the rural area. Man position, man rights, etc. Now there is no ground for it. And therefore, abnormal situation of due to this, and everybody knows how, what is the level of corruption, to this level of corruption generates completely different social insertions, and in this new social insertion, children don't feel the need to listen to their parents. These are the guys who have the most network to grasp the nature of urban culture. They teach very fast to their parents how if they have to behave, they have to change their accent how they should not appear like farmers, villagers. Children become the teacher. In the, when they were in rural environment, parents were at endum, uh, the teacher of values, of reference, of culture. Now, the 12 years old boy or girl corrects constantly the accent, the wording, the behavior of the parents. So you have a complete shifting of gender position, general, generational position, while the frame, the global frame of the society was set for previous stage. Is it clear? Oh. <laughs> um, could you just expand on what the concept of corruption is, 
Um, corruption, in my understanding, represents the contamination or transformation of some sort of pure form. But what you're drawing attention to is that the different cultural forms are in constant flux and there's a constant process of interpenetration. Um, is corruption anything more than the normal dynamic of change that occurs um, both in terms of historical changes and in terms of uh, the contact of, uh, be between cultures?